right. You guys can go ahead and grab your seats. Welcome to uh, Calvary Chapel, Fredericksburg. My name is uh, Seth. I oversee the youth and young adults here, and so I have the privilege of uh, finishing up our cults and false teachings uh, series uh, tonight. And uh, while we only covered four, um, did we cover four? Yeah, four of them. Um, you know, we, as the Lord led us to, I believe that th- this is what we needed to hear. And so uh, tonight I'm going to be covering lies that our culture believes. I want to give you a little bit, just before I get started, of, of the heart of, of why we're going to deal with lies. And I, and I believe, not, not just so that we won't be deceived. Um, you guys, we, you know, we were going through Second Peter. We need to know the truth. We need to know God's word. So I don't want to just say all this because I don't want us to be deceived. Uh, maybe that is one application. But that we would know how to engage our culture. Uh, so I have different... Um, you know, arguments and points that we can use to, if we're in a conversation with somebody, if we're dealing with a friend or a neighbor or a loved one, and we're having these conversations, and they find themselves uh, wrapped up in some of these lies, that we would be able to know and navigate it. Uh, Because one of the things I think that most of us are afraid of, and most of us can can get a little bit um, intimidated about, is that we, we just don't know enough. I mean, how many guys would say that? Sometimes it's hard to in, engage with people because I just don't know enough. So tonight I want to equip us um, in some of the aspects of how, t- how, do I, how do I engage this topic or this lie in our culture and to, and to use it um, with them and, and to help them, to bring them to a knowledge of who God is or that the fact that God even exists and that we can go from there. Uh, so it's not going to be verbatim, I, I, but, but I'll have some arguments for us uh, to deal with. But I, I want us to not be deceived, but I also want us to learn to engage, okay? So let's, um, if you guys have a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we're going we're gonna to be looking at Romans 1, verses 18 to 32 tonight. Romans 1, verses 18 to 32, And if anyone needs a Bible and you don't have one, would you just quickly slip up your hand? Sorry, Chuck, I saw you back there. I I, that's I was like, why are you standing up? That's why. If if you need a Bible, just slip up your hand and uh, Chuck can get you one. We have one over here. And if you guys are there, Romans chapter one. Let's just read verse eighteen, and then we will will pray. Romans one, verse eighteen. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Let's pray. Lord, we do ask as we've opened up your word, God, that you would open up our hearts, that you would equip us in our modern-day Babylon, Lord. You would equip us in a culture full of lies, that we would not be intimidated, for we have the truth. You are the truth. You are the way. You are the life. And I pray for anyone who may be believing lies today, Lord, that they would be convicted by your word, by your grace, by your kindness, Lord, that you are allowing them even to to breathe today and that your grace would come in and save and rescue from the lies, Lord. So be with us, Lord, in this big text and a big topic, Lord. Would you just make it um, simple, Lord, for us to digest and to remember, Lord, Thank you for the great privilege of gathering together. We love you, we thank you, we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. All right. So Paul, in writing Romans, is writing um, a manifesto, if you would, of the gospel. It's one of the richest books that you can read about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in chapters 1 to 3, he's really bringing all men under the guilty verdict of God's law. 
that all men are sinners in need of salvation. The pagans, the Jews, those who claim to be religious, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so as we begin this section of of Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul opens up the section of Scripture with a revelation. Would you notice again, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Now, in verse 17, he explained that in the gospel message, verses 16 and 17, that what is revealed in the gospel message of Jesus Christ is righteousness. So in Christ, in the gospel, you have righteousness, but then then that's the good news. And then he turns us to some bad news, which is now there's a place where the wrath of God is being revealed. And Paul, in this section, begins to give us an exposition, if you would, of the problems of the culture that he was witnessing and prophetically in which we are living. For Paul wrote from Corinth. And just imagine Paul looking out his window as he pens the book of Romans and he sees all sorts of wickedness and sin. And so he writes, especially this section, in light of what is happening, the cultural moment of Corinth. And what Paul sees taking place in Corinth, and what you and I can see taking place today, is what Paul tells us is the wrath of God being revealed. So what do we mean when we say the wrath of God is being revealed? Well, the wrath of God is both now, but is also future that there is a future wrath to come on those who reject Christ. It begins, as we read in Scripture, with Jacob's trouble, or what we would call the Great Tribulation period, where God begins to pour out His wrath or His judgment on an unbelieving world. And it will culminate in the Great White Throne Judgment as He judges unbelievers, those who have rejected Jesus Christ, into what is called the Lake of Fire or Hell. But Paul is not speaking of that time period, for he's telling us that right now the wrath of God is being revealed. And so how is God's wrath being revealed? It is through this, guys, if you're taking notes, through God's abandonment of a people to their desires and their wants. He says, I see God's wrath in men getting what they want without restriction without holding it back. What we are witnessing today in our time and what Paul was seeing out in Corinth, guys, was what a world looks like when God abandons a people and he gives them what they want. Now, God's abandonment is not saying that God is not offering salvation still. Or that he's not at work through his spirit and through his church. But what it means is that God is returning the favor. That when a culture or a people abandon God, God says, and I will abandon you. You don't want my way. I will give you your way. You remember the the children of Israel. I want a king like the nations. And so what did God give them? He gave them a king. And who is his name? Saul. Saul. And he was not a good king. Or, hey, I want, you know, Israel, I want to be like the nations. I want to worship all these gods. I love the idolatry of all the nations. Great. Go be a slave in Babylon. That is what it looks like when God abandons a people. He gives them what they want to the full. I I even think about Israel complaining about meat. You guys remember that? Uh, in, in the, right after leaving Egypt. And, and what does he say? You are going to eat quail until it comes out your nostrils, right? Like that's God giving man what they want. And, and Paul says, this is the wrath of God being revealed. This is the wrath of God being revealed. And he says in verse 18 as well that those who the wrath of God is being revealed in and to are those who are suppressing the truth of God, and unrighteousness. And so tonight I want to look at five lies, five lies that the culture then and now are believing in order to suppress the truth of God 
which will lead to three specific moments that God's wrath is revealed. You guys ready? Let's go. Lie number one is that God does not exist. Look at what it says in verse 19. It says, because what may be known of God is manifest, what is it, in them, for God has shown it to them. And so in verse 19, Paul explains that the truth of God, the reality of God, the existence of God has been made known and manifest and revealed, notice the two, to two tenses, in them and to them. In them and to them. And so there are four ways that we see God revealing himself to all of humanity. The first one, if you're taking notes, is our conscience. Our conscience. This speaks of the moral law that is within man. As a created being, guys, we are both body and spirit. And so the way that we come to know things in our body is through our, our senses, our five senses. But the way that we come to understand truth is through our reasoning and our conscience. In the inner man of every person to ever exist, there is a law. It's a right and wrong experience that we all have experienced. And this is what the Bible teaches us to be our conscience. It leads us and guides us because we have been made in the image of God. We can all, uh, we can call this the moral law. And while all men are born lost through sin, by the conviction of our conscience, we can eagerly seek answers in which the Bible says that when we seek God with all of our heart, he will be found. So within our conscience, we have right and wrong. We're able to discern if there's right and wrong, if there's a moral law in us, there must be a what? A moral law giver. And so our conscience points us to God. The second way we're pointed to God in us is through reasoning. In our makeup, God has created us to be a people who reason through cause and effect instincts. So as we see things around us, we reason back to the cause. One of the greatest cause and effects that we see in reason back to God, Paul says in verse 20, is creation, or as we might call it, general revelation. Look at what it says in verse 20. He says, for since the creation of the world, notice, his invisible attributes are what? Clearly seen. And being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So we read here that with our moral conscience and reasoning, we can come to the conclusion that God exists through his creation. A created thing must have a what? Creator. And in the world, we see uniformity, we see order, we see beauty, we see power, in us, as, as human beings, we see communication and character. We see conscience and work. And based on all of that, if all creation must have a creator, then we can reason and conclude, well, that God is beautiful and strong and creative and communicative and moral, and he's working, that he's holy because we have a moral law within us. And so through creation, we look outside and we go, there must be a creator. And lastly, we have special revelation. Creation is general revelation. We have special revelation. This is the last way we can know God. And it's through special revelation, through the prophets and the apostles, through the eyewitness accounts in Scripture. Now this gives us insight to what we cannot know by reason and looking at creation. While we know that God is holy and moral and powerful by general revelation, God's special revelation, and when he breaks into history to speak to us, tells us things like this, that God is loving, that God is gracious, that God cares for us, that we must be saved by grace through faith and not of works. Now, what does this all have to do with our topic? Well, 
This is where the lie comes in. Notice verse 21. It says, because although they knew God, notice, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. You see, then and today, we have as the narrative in our culture that there is no God, or that we cannot know that there is God. That's the atheist, and that is the agnostic. That creation has a different causation. That, hey, we are the effects of random chances. We have evolved from slime or tiny bacteria that has made it this far. Hey, we are the survival of the fittest, the world says. Through the theory of Darwin, we just happen to exist. Now, why I bring this up is because this is one of the major suppressors of truth today. Listen, guys, if I can darken my reasoning for why I exist, if I can remove a creator from creation, then I can excuse my reasoning of cause and effect. I can excuse, listen, my conviction of my conscience, and I can reject anything of any authority over me. This is the lie. It starts here. This is the most foundational lie in our world, that God is not there, that we are not created, and therefore we can live autonomously in this random happenstance that we call life. All the other lies flow from this single lie, which is the greatest suppression of truth. And so with this first lie of creation and origin is the domino effect. And this is the sin that must be dealt with first in our culture. It's that of what? Unbelief. Unbelief and the rejection of God. And so when you guys are talking with friends, maybe you're dealing with a loved one who denies the existence of God. Here's an apologetic argument that you can use, that, that I like to use, or that I like to think through. It's what we call the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument. And it goes like this, ready? Anything that begins to exist had a cause. The universe began to exist. I mean, that's, that's just a known fact from, not, from those who are atheists and scientific and naturalists. They all bring it down to a point of time. They call it what? The Big Bang. So the universe began to exist. Therefore, ready? The universe must have a cause. And to take it a couple steps further, this cause, are you guys staying with me? This cause must be eternal and uncaused. God is the most reasonable explanation for such an uncaused first cause. Okay, there you go. So you got to write that down because that's, that's a lot to, to unpack. But here's what, here's what really it boils down to. Ready? Time, space, and matter all had to come into existence at the same time. If that is true, then whoever brought it into existence must be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial. And this points us to, the, really, the biblical account of who God is. So even there, you can just point them out that, hey, you're rejecting any kind of being, any kind of God, but he, look at creation. If it started, it must have been, it, if it has a beginning, it must have been started. It must have been created. Or you can use something simpler, like a watch illustration. As you could say that if you're walking in a forest and you find a wristwatch, what do you conclude? I conclude that somebody was here and dropped their watch, or maybe some airplane flew over and dropped the watch, or something was there. But you, it would be unreasonable for you to think that a storm came by, started ripping up all the ground, the raw material in the ground, and through it smacking against a bunch of trees and rocks, began to form this thing that we call a, a watch and began to put all the pieces together and to form a battery and then pop it in the back and then make these little hands to start twitching. A watch concludes to us that there was a watchmaker or there was somebody who had a watch. And so you can use these kind of arguments to just point out that it is, it's, it's unreasonable for you to believe that there is not a creator. 
One last one I can say is that the atheist or the agnostic who doesn't believe in a creator has to believe actually six miracles. You know, as a believer, we only have to believe in one miracle, that God spoke and it was created. The atheist or those who re reject God must believe six miracles. I didn't put these on the notes, so write these down. First, existence comes from non-existence. That's what they believe. Order comes from chaos. Life comes from non-life. Personal comes from non-personal. Reason comes from non-reason. And morality comes from matter. So, I don't know which one you have to have more faith to believe. Do I have to believe six miracles or I can believe that uh, a logically uh, understood, you know, cause to effect reasoning that says that there's creation and there's a creator. And so you can use these to engage with or talk to your friends and family. The second lie we come into that the culture believes, lie number two, is that truth is subjective. Look at what it says at the end of verse 20. It says, so that they are without excuse. So verse 20 tells us that we are without excuse for doing what is right because through our conscience and reason and revelation, we have, we have all we need to conform our lives to the truth of God and the reality that he does exist. Now what is truth? Well, truth is what corresponds to reality. And in the reality we live, guys, God exists. His word is truth. He is holy. Especially us in the West, we have all the revelations alive and well with us. We have creation. We have the word of God. We have reasoning. We have our conscience. And so we are especially without excuse. However, what we see today is this, guys. Listen, if I can replace God with theory, then I can replace truth for lies. Now, Isaiah taught us that in chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Sounds like your coffee, Dad. <laughs> Verse 21, notice where it is. Ready? Here's where it comes from. Woe to those who are wise in their what? Their own eyes. That's where it is. I don't need God to be wise. I need myself and prudent in their own sight. And so today we have a complete lack of acceptance of reality for what is relative. The lie is relativism. It is a lie that the world holds in order to be kept from being accountable to God. While God will hold them without excuse, they use this just to put a little blindfold over their eyes. I like what Kokel says. He says, if there is no God, there is nothing left but self and power. We become the landlords, not the tenants of the earth. That's, that's the switch that takes place. If God exists and I, I live in his world, under his authority, right, parents? What do we say? Who's, who, who, who pays the bills here, right? I mean, we use that, right? The same God would say, uh, who created this? Who's in charge? But if I say, oh, there is no God, then, oh, then it's free reign. I can do what I want. And so the relativism is the second lie. What is relativism? Relativism is the belief that there is no absolute truth, that all truth is within us and how we perceive reality. So if there is no God, like Coco says, then we become the owner and the source of our own reality. Geisler, Norman Geisler says this when skeptics ask. He says, either truth is relative to time and space, it was true then but not now, or it is relative to persons, true for me but not for you. And isn't that what we hear today? What do we hear today? It's my truth. Well, my, this is my truth. You have your truth, I have my truth. Well, what if my truth says your truth's wrong? Who wins, right? I mean, who's the winner of that? That's relativism. Either something is true at a certain time because of the majority rule, or it's true to me and only me. And so this is where we are today, guys. We have suppressed the truth about God, and now in our culture, we have replaced reason and reality. 
for our own personal desires. And you know what's really convenient about relativism? You can never be wrong. I can just change my truth. This isn't true for me anymore. I like this one better, right? Guys, but listen, no one lives truly by relativism. At some point, we know there is truth. And this is where the conversation, we can go with people if they bring this up. For instance, the statement, there is no absolute truth. You know what you can say to them? Is that absolutely true? That sounds like a truth statement. Is that just true for you? Is that true for me? Guys, no one can actually live this way. They try to trick themselves to keep them out of accountability, but no one lives by true relativism. We all have truth. But you see, if I can get rid of truth, you know what else I can get rid of? And this is the third lie, is morality. Morality becomes relative. Look at what it says in verse 21 and 22. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Notice, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. So they know God. They cannot escape the reality of God, but they choose to reject Him as as if to say, if I don't believe in God, then He doesn't exist. Now, Kokel brings this up again in his book, and he says, mere belief cannot change a single thing about the way the world actually is. If you and I don't believe in gravity, for example, you will not float away. Well, if I don't believe in God, then God doesn't exist. That's not how it works. God does not cease to exist based on the culture accepting or rejecting him. He is the reality that we all live in. But what they know of God... They do not take it to that step further to honor him, to worship him. And notice, or even to be thankful to him for life. And Paul says when that happens, their thoughts become futile and their hearts become foolish and darkened. The word futile means to make empty, to be vain, to be foolish. And notice he says in their thoughts. That is the thinking of a man deliberating within himself. And when that takes place, the heart, the place, the control room of our life becomes foolish. It's un- unintelligent, without understanding, or don't tell my kids, but stupid. <laughs> and he says, and it becomes that way through the darkness. That is the ignorance regarding divine things. And so Paul says that when I reject God, my thought processes fail to work. My heart that is making decisions becomes full of foolishness and darkness. You guys know what Psalm 14 one says. The fool says in his heart, there is what? No God. Or Proverbs 9.10, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But the lack of the fear of God is really where foolishness begins. When I disconnect from God, or when the world disconnects from God, who is the reality, who is truth, guys, we are left in darkness. And so the third lie of the culture is that morality is relative because they are darkened, because they are suppressing their guilt and shame by suppressing the truth of who God is. However, no one, again, can live in moral relativism. We all know that there are moral duties within us. That is, we all know that there are certain moral laws that we are to keep. At all times and in all places, rape, murder, stealing, even lying is wrong. And if there is an outlier, I will tell you that they have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. If we have moral laws or moral obligations, again, then we have a moral lawgiver. God within himself is moral, and he communicates to us his morality through being made in the image of God. You know, a lot of times when you're dealing with our culture, you will be dealt with, uh, they will deal with us in, in the terms of evil, how many of you guys have ever, have ever had a conversation where they said, religion is evil? Anyone ever heard that? Or Christianity is evil? Or if God is good, why evil? Anyone ever heard of that before? 
Well, here's, here's, an, here's a, a conversation that you can have with them. If morality is relative, then what is your complaint? What, what is evil? You can't even explain evil. You shouldn't even use the term evil. Where do you get your standard for evil? Because if to know evil means that you must know what? Good. And if there is no God and there is no authority over us telling us right and wrong, then guys, in our culture right now, what is wrong with slavery? What is wrong with racism? What is wrong with rape? What is wrong with murder? What is wrong with, with uh, uh, trafficking people? Why are so many people angry today? Why social justice if there is no morality? Or if everyone can just choose their own morality? I'll tell you why. Because in all of us, we have a moral law code. Because God, the moral law giver, created us in his image. C.S. Lewis stated, As an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of what a straight line is. Guys, we know that there is absolute morality, even if they want to suppress it. But in doing this, in suppressing truth, in rejecting God, and and making morality relative, what the, what the world is doing is the fourth lie, is they become their own God. In verse 23 it says, And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into, image, into an image made like, notice, corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. The word to change means to exchange one thing for another. And so what are they doing? If there is no God and there is no truth and I don't have a moral law to live by, then I become my own God. Now, not a lot of people will say that, but if you are like, this is my life, I'm going to do what I want, no one can tell me what to do, you are becoming your own God. You are the authority in your life. And the first thing that we make our gods like is us. This is the birth of idolatry is I want to do life my way. We guys are, have been created to be worshiping beings. It's in our nature, guys, to worship and reflect and give honor and glory to God. But if you and I dethrone God in our lives, something else will be lifted up in his place. And it's often you and me. We often find the religion or the spirituality or the, the you know, um, contemplative, uh, you know, Musa, uh, you know, yoga classes or whatever it is to fit what I like. I like this. This is my thing. This helps me. You know what you're saying is you are God. You are saying you are God and God is not God. And you have no excuse to say that because you know there is a God. And you're convicted about that. And that's why you have to do so much to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The idolatry truly is all about us. And even if we make things in the, in the likeness of birds and four-footed animals and creeping things, it really has to do with us. Because we get to tell ourselves what that God or that idol wants from us. And so if you're a works-based person, you love the gods that tell you you got to work a lot because you get to pat yourself on the back. Or if you're a, god that ju- or you're, if you're a person that just loves, you know, um, immorality and just doing whatever you want, whatever feels good, you know, hedonism, then you're going to find a god that says, go and do whatever you want and, and live that way. Even if it's created in a, in a picture of a bird or a stone, or you look at the stars in your constellation, you are your own God. That's what the constellations are. Your, your hand reading, your palm readings, your, your horos- the, the horrific scopes, you know? That's, it's all about you. And it's selfish and it's demonic. Genesis 3, 5 gives us the temptation of Satan that says, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You know, the sad thing is, they were already made in the image of God. 
So it's not saying you'll be made in the image of God. It means you will take the place of God. You're going to be like him. You're going to be able to call the shots of what is good and what is evil. It's demonic. And this is where it leads to, guys. And when you and I become our own God, then we determine the purpose of life. We get to do what pleases me. To live for what feels good to me. And guys, when this is what a nation desires, it leads us to our fifth lie and that we live for what feels right. Paul concludes the chapter with the judgment of God and abandoning a people to what they want. It's a scary place to be, guys, when God gives you what you want and not what you need. Oh, you can, you can just keep banging on that door, banging on that door, banging on that door. You guys have been there? Maybe this, here's a little bit of application. You know, we're, we're real heavy. We're going to get into some things, but here's an application. You know, you, you're wanting God's will for your life, and you keep just banging on the door, and God is telling you no. You know what? The, the worst thing for you is for him to open that door, but he will, and he'll let you experience it. He'll let you walk in it. He'll let you go and experience that thing that you want so badly, And you know what it's going to do? It's going to lead you back to a place of humiliation, humility, and that's where God gives us grace. Isn't that crazy? That's that's the God we serve. But he's not going to force you and put your arm behind your back and twist your arm and make you do it. So this is what it looks like when when a person, even a believer, wants to reject God's will for his life. He'll let you go your way. Just t- come back and tell us later. To get, you can have a testimony night on a third Wednesday of what happened. You don't have to go that way. The, the culture does not have to go this way. They have every reason, every, everything is pointing to, to worship God and to be connected with God. And they reject it. And this is what it takes place. There are three signs of a nation, of a people, of a society that God has abandoned. These are the three signs signs of God's wrath being revealed. The first sign of God giving up his people is in uh, verse 24 and 25, which is rampant sexual immorality. Verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The first sign that God is giving a nation up is the sexual immorality that is blatant and rampant. And notice in verse 25, it tells us that God gave them up because they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Notice it doesn't say a lie, but the lie. And again, I tell you, the lie is that God does not exist and I want to be my own God. They worship self and the creation, notice, rather than the creator. And so God gave them up. Here is the revealing of God's wrath. And notice, he gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts and to, notice, dishonor their bodies among themselves. Guys, the restraints come off of a people when they reject God. They push the boundaries as far as they can and they desire to have intimacy with whomever they want. And yet God says, I'm giving you up to this because you want it, but it's unclean and it's dishonorable. Interesting statements there. It's unclean, and it's dishonorable. In the book, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With?, Sam Alberry shows us that all people have boundaries on sex. However, the world looks at us as being prudish or repressive, and yet this is so far from the truth. God has given sex as a means and a gift to be experienced and enjoyed in the context of a marriage, which is a strong covenant between a man and a woman for life. Every every power tool that you guys have comes with a great load of how to use it and don't use it this way. Is, Is that not true? And so God sees a beautiful gift that is wonderful in one context 
and is destructive in another. It's like a fire. Think about a fireplace. You're starting a fire in your house. You ever think about that? It's safe when it's in the fireplace. It's terrible when it's on the couch or in the bedroom. It will set the whole house on fire. So God gives us boundaries. But the, the world says, oh, yeah, but you guys in your boundary, you're so restrictive. No, no, we're not. God has given us the gift of sex in order to bring unity and oneness and reproduction and to bring about life. If you guys remember the Me Too movement, they showed us this, that there were two boundaries that they cried out for, consent and not being taken advantage of. And the world might say, well, those are obvious. However, they are boundaries. So no one actually believes in full, rampant sexual immorality. There is always a boundary. Even in the world that rejects God, there is always a place where it's too far. So Sam Alberry goes on to say, I like it, he says, what is distinctive about the Christian understanding of sexual ethics then is not the presence of boundaries, but where those boundaries are located and for what reason. We are concerned with boundaries precisely because we're convinced, listen, that sexuality matters and its abuse also matters. This is why we have they, they call us repressive. It's because we have boundaries set for good reasons. God has set the boundaries for good reasons. And so this topic of sex, as it relates to God giving us boundaries, is not that God does not like the gift that he has given to us. That would be, that would be crazy. What he doesn't like, notice, is what it does to us, which he says to dishonor your bodies. It is dishonoring and it is damaging when you and I go outside of the boundaries that God has set up. And yet when a world and a culture rejects God, his ways and his standards, this is what we get. We get destruction. We get dishonoring. It is, it is, it is the first sign that God's wrath is over a society and a people. Now, there's three outcomes that I wrote down. I'm sure we can all think of different ones. That this sexual revolution or this rampant sexual immorality produces. Number one, it destroys families. For people will throw off the restraint of marriage, and this will affect deeply the children conceived and the moms and dads left in its wake. And Paul says it's the sin against ourselves as we engage in sexual immorality. Because we are becoming one with somebody, the Bible says, and then we're ripping ourselves off and then attaching ourselves again to another. It is destructive. It is wrong. It's, secondly, it's uh, destroying life in the womb. In the Old Testament, there were two gods that were always linked together, even to be said were married. It is the gods Ashtoreth, who is the God of love and fertility, and Molech, the God of shameful child sacrifice. Wherever you're going to have blatant and rampant sexual immorality, you will then quickly see abortion right behind it. Because what happens when we have rampant sexual immorality is you have babies. And it was the belief with Molech that when a couple sacrificed their firstborn, look how evil this is, they believed that Molech would ensure financial prosperity for a family and future children. Here we find a couple of gods working together. Mass sexual immorality leads to the death of children due to unwanted pregnancies. In 2023, more than a million abortions were provided in the U.S. That's a major finding from a report published by the uh, Gutmasher Institute, a research organization that supports access to abortions. And then one of their guys writes, to be precise, researchers estimate that there were 1,026,700 abortions in 2023. That's the highest number in over a decade. It's a sad place when sexual immorality is rampant. Now, I don't know if you know this guy. His name is Seth Gruber. I kind of like him. Um, okay, joke. 
but um, he's a he he's a, a pro life speaker. He's really he's really great. And I've just been seeing this clip of him uh, going around. And I just want to r- kind of read the essence of what he said. He says, "Abortion is the anti gospel. It is my body, and the baby must die so that I may live." You must die so that I can continue in the suppression of truth and reality of my sin. But when Jesus came, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus gave up his body for the sake of others. Abortion says, give up their body for your own. And so abortion is rampant because sexual immorality is rampant. And so that is the second... Uh, destruction it brings and the third one as we move on is that sexual immorality leads to more perversity if you're taking notes in verses 26 to 27 we have unnatural sexuality it says for this reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. The second mark that God has give, gave up a, man, a, a, a society is described here as vile, unnatural, and shameful. And what is specifically explained here, described here, is lesbianism and homosexuality. You see, guys, when you exchange God for a lie, there is nothing you won't exchange. We read here that women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Man leaving or exchanging the natural use of a woman for other men. And today, specifically, we have the exchanging of genders in the transgender movement of our day. This is where darkened minds and rejection of God sends us. From the beginning of creation to revelation in the scriptures, homosexuality is a sin. Jesus was not silent on the issue when he called marriage between a man and a woman, and that is they become one flesh in Matthew 19:6. He taught us in Matthew 15, 9, that out of our heart flows fornication, which is where we get our word uh, pornea or porn, which encapsulates all sexual deviance from God's standard. You have Paul and all the apostles also writing of the sin of homosexuality, that it is not God's good plan. Homosexuality twists and distorts God's good and creative order for life and human flourishing. It manipulates and mocks God's plan, and in that it is an offense to God, and it reflects God as something that he is not, as we have been made in his image. And so let me just put that down before we move any further. It is a sin. It is sinful. Now, two things I want to say about homosexuality. The first one is this. Homosexuality is a sin just as much as heterosexual sin is sin. Because from Genesis to Revelation, God also condemns heterosexual sins. What I'm trying to get at is, listen, it is not this grandiose, greater, all the way over in the, in the, in the far corner sin. It is sin. Period. Just like murder is sin and lying is sin, so is homosexuality. It is sin. And both are, need to, are, both are wrong and both people found in either one or in all sins have to repent and turn back to God. Amen? Amen. Are we all understanding? Yes. Now let me explain why homosexuality does get a little bit of a different attention. Homosexuality and transgenderisms are such a different sin because they are unnatural. They not only have God's word calling it sin, but even nature itself, as verses 26 and 27 read, does not fit in to the homosexual relationship. Biologically, it does not work. Nor interpersonally, it does not work. God made men and women and their bodies 
and their gender and their sexes and whatever other word you want to put in there to complement one another to reflect God in his nature and character. And to mess up and to move around that equation is sin and it is unnatural. And so this is why it is a different sin. It is different in its category because it's unnatural, but it is still sin, and sin is sin. Does that make sense? So I want you guys to understand that because I don't want you to think like, oh, the homosexual came in, ah, you know, that's why they call you like a homophobic. It's not, but, but it is different. It's unnatural. Listen, guys, no, there will never be an outlet for the homosexual to express their sexuality and please God. For those struggling with heterosexual sins, there is an outlet, and it's called marriage. So as you come to Christ, and you're struggling, and you're wanting to get uh, free from heterosexual sin, there is an outlet for that, because God created marriage between a man and a woman. Nowhere will you be able to find homosexuality being able to be expressed and it pleasing God, because it is a distortion of God's order, His creation and his purpose, guys. Amen. Now hear me, this does not mean we don't have sympathy for people, especially for those who are struggling with same-sex attraction who come to Christ and work through that sanctification process. There is much to be thought through. There is much to uh, absorb and to take in, and they need grace as much as we need grace. However, there is a false teaching that has been trending in churches today that doesn't just sympathize. Sympathy is finding a cure for somebody that you have pity for. There is an empathy taking place in the church today that is calling same-sex attracted believers to not act, but also to not change. They call this side B Christianity, which seeks to celebrate their gayness, but do not act on it. Guys, this is destructive and dangerous. All of us have been born with a sin nature and with desires towards things that are unholy. And all people, all Christians who come to Christ must allow God to change us outside, yes, but also on the inside. There is no place in the church for celebration of sin, no action or desire within us. Because what will begin to happen is you and I will begin to condone their sin. And so we have to be careful, guys. Now some people might tell us, as I'm, as I'm coming to a close, some people might tell us, well, I was born this way. So to say I cannot act on this desire is oppressive. And here's what we need to make clear to them, that everyone has desires that need to be dealt with. Not every desire we have should be acted on. I mean, if you ever wanted to punch somebody in the face, good thing you didn't act on it, right? Only a couple people who want to do that, right? <laughs> Thought there was more of us. Or if you're married and you find another man or a woman attractive, that is not a good pla- that's not a good thing for you to act upon that desire. We all, guys, have a cross to bear. Every Christian has a cross to bear. And for them, that is the cross that they have to crucify daily. That desire has to be crucified daily and allowing the Holy Spirit to walk with them. And so as we live in the culture where LGBTQ is reigning right now, we got to recognize that this is God allowing our culture to be given over to what it wants. Now, I want to just say one more thing on um, one point on transgenderism, and it's just this. that This is just the, the typical tactic of Satan to give false gospels. You see, what transgenderism does is it, it feeds off the idea that something is broken, and I need transformation. And so just like those false teachers who are like wells without water, you, these people who are searching for this brokenness and how to fix it, they meet these false teachers in society, and they say, hey, you are broken, so you need to change your body. The gospel says, you are broken, let me change your heart. 
Because far after you transition, you will still have within your heart brokenness that will still need to be fixed. It doesn't work, guys. And one day the, the floor is going to drop out from all under all of these in our culture who are living this way. And when that happens, you and I as the church of Jesus Christ need to be ready and prepared to receive and not to reject. I remind you that you go to a Calvary Chapel and the Calvary Chapel movement was, was birthed in the midst of the sexual revolution among hippies. And so don't think that God cannot do today what he did back then. Because we're living in another sexual revolution, and God's hands aren't tied. I mean, God might have given us over, but one day he's going to allow the floor to drop out, and where are we going to be? And are we going to be ready? And are we going to be those who accept those who are broken and actually have a well full of water and the grace of God through Jesus Christ? And the last part of Romans, as we finish, is moral anarchy. You have sexual uh, deviance, you have, you have this unnatural sexuality, and it leads then to moral anarchy. Let's, let's just finish reading this, and then I will pray. And then he goes on to say in verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. That's the third time. Notice, to a debased mind. To do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. There are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And so, guys, the fallout and, and the last tell, tell, tell sign that God has given up a nation is total anarchy. It is just, you know what, if you let, you let this line go, okay, well, we'll accept homosexuals and homosexual marriage. Okay, the next line gets pushed. Well, I need you to call me, uh, you know, I'm, uh, call me a woman, but I'm a man. You need to call me, uh, you know, um, a, 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 a man, cause I, but I'm a woman. And so that gets pushed. The next thing you know is that, well, what can we stop? And what can we say no to? And so it all breaks loose. Now, my exhortation to us today is in verse 32 that says, not only do they do the same, but they approve of those who practice them. Guys, let us not be the church that approves what our culture practices. Just to wrap up this whole teaching series, today there are those in the church who approve of false teachings, who are watching TBN, who are reading these famous books of false teachers, who have started dabbling into weird practices that you've never heard of before. You need to cut it out. That's our exhortation. There are many in the church who are willing to compromise the truth for the sake of relationships and not being labeled a type of way. You need to fear God and not man. There are some in the church who are Hey, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, it's, it's okay to be in a cult. It's okay to have a different religion. You know, all roads lead to God. You need to cut it out. You know the truth. There is one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, there are many of us who don't see the harm of LGBTQ, abortion, sex outside of marriage, uh, living, uh, you know, outside of wedlock, uh, doing all sorts of these things that are listed here. And what you are approving when you say that it's fine and you justify it is you are saying to the world that I don't mind that your mind is darkened and I don't mind if you stay there. Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for the sins that our culture is parading and celebrating today. And for you and I to support them would make us just as guilty of them doing it themselves. And so I'll end with this verse. 1 Corinthians 6 says this, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, 
nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Let us not approve what God has saved us from because they don't have the truth and we do. Lastly, here are some resources if you guys want them. Some of the books that I I was reading to put this together. Uh, We'll leave it up there. When Skeptics Ask by Norman Geisler. Cold Case Christianity, J. Warner Wallace. Street Smarts by Gregory Kokel. Uh, This one, uh, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age by Rosaria Butterfield is uh, good. I'm listening to that still. And Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? So you guys want to take a picture of it, you guys can look them up. Uh, I'll, have the, I'll have it after, but I'll pray because I think I, I'm over my time. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for today and just for this opportunity we have, Lord, to gather. And, Lord, such a, just a, a big topic, Lord, in our culture. And so I pray, Lord, that we would feel a little bit more equipped today, Lord, to go out into our culture, Lord, uh, not just to be ready to argue, but to be ready to listen. Lord, while many in our culture are rejecting you, God, a lot of them are broken. And so would we not just be preachers, Lord, but would we also be listeners? Would we be discerning? And would we have agape love filling our hearts and our minds, Lord? So go before our day, Lord. Would would, would what is of you, Lord, be um, just settle into our hearts and our minds, Lord? Would would the text of your word through Romans, Lord, just be a a point for us to go back and, and to read and to look into, Lord? God, we just thank you for tonight. And as we worship you and as we end this night, Lord, would you just uh, meet us here in a fresh way. Send us on, Lord, into this world, Lord, being salt and light. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.